a lot for joining in. Uh, we have got a huge numbers uh, who are joining in and a lot of people are uh, still uh, waiting uh, to join in. So, first of all, let me welcome everyone today to the first of its kind Cyber Threats online panel discussion on how cybersecurity is or can enable businesses to say stay safe and secured in COVID-19 pandemic situation. We have a very excellent panel out here. We have a CRO, a CISO, and a security specialist. As you know, at CyberFred, we always promote community learning. We reached out to them who are working at ground zero and taking up the challenges head on. So what's a better way to learn from the fresh experiences? So let's begin. For participants attending this session, you are all now on listen-only mode. Feel free to ask any doubts. Our discussions, uh, we will address it at the end. Uh, you can put it on the chat or you can put it on Twitter uh, with hashtag CyberFact and hashtag COVID-19 cybersecurity. So before that, let me introduce you. So once we, before we start, let me introduce you to the panelists. We have uh, Mr. S. V. Sundakrishnan. He is the current CRO at Reliance Nippon Life Insurance and handling many has ha, has handled many leadership positions for risk management, compliance, claims, information security, and fraud prevention. He has had a very long career of 35 years after, uh, since 1984. Uh, followed by uh, he has worked at Deloitte. ENY, Standard Chartered, Bank International Indonesia, Credit Lyons Bank, ING Vesia, DSP Merrill Lynch, and has been part of Reliance Nippon since 2000, uh, 2006. He's also been a very active volunteer with Isaka India, Isaka Mobile Chapter, and IRDAI. We have a next panelist, uh, again an eminent speaker. Uh, he's one of the few CISOs, uh, you know, who has been engaged in information security and compliance since day one of his career since 1999. Today, he is a CISO at FIS India. He is a certified uh, system auditor. He is a risk management professional from Isaka. He is an ethical hacker with 20 plus years of experience in InfoSec, enterprise risk management, cybersecurity, project management, and business continuity. He's got an extensive management and consulting skills and practices development across uh, different security disciplines, processes, technology, and standards. Welcome, Kalpesh, sir. Uh, the third uh, panelist which we have is Dr. Aditya Mukherjee. Uh, he has uh, received a PhD degree in uh, one of his research papers. He is an information security leader with 14 plus experience when leadership roles across multiple InfoSec domains such as uh, in different verticals, uh, such as defense, law enforcement, financial services, health, public service. Uh, worked on a lot of cybersecurity products, resources, uh, involved in communications, media, technology. Uh, currently, he is leading a global uh, security operations center for a U.S. bank. Welcome, all the panelists. And... Uh, before we start, uh, there is a disclaimer uh, on behalf of all the panelists. Uh, views mentioned during this online panel discussions are purely situational and advice from the learning and sharing from the experience of the fellow practitioners on CyberFred platform. It is advised to all participants to practice discretion before application of any resolution advice during this discussion. So let's start. So. Uh, uh, Gaurav, before we start, I just wanted to check, uh, we have uh, Sundar sir on board. Okay, I'll uh, continue with it. I think they're still, they're still resolving the issue. So let's start with the panel discussions. So today, as we know, the pandemic situation which was started in China, Wuhan province in last December and has affected 150 plus countries and we have uh, news which are being floating that there have been more than 10,000 deaths reported across the world. 
and some good news where China has successfully showed the sign of recoveries. But there is another concerns where EU, European Union has become the new epicenter. In India, we have uh, we are still in the start and quite controlled. We have still have more than uh, 251 confirmed cases. Uh, we have started reporting recovery, uh, almost 9% of the recovery is there. Uh, still there are deaths, about two to four deaths are there. And so now as we look at the current facts, we have passed the initial phase and as we are entering at very crucial phase and the number of cases are increasing exponentially. We see that the state of Maharashtra is the most affected with the maximum number of cases discovered in this region. And uh, there have been a recent update that the government of Maharashtra has locked down Bombay and Pune. Uh, and we are moving towards the zero movement uh, for next few weeks. Is that the concern? So today, the worry is uh, not about that will we survive this pandemic? We will of course survive. The human uh, nature is to survive and we have adapted across the generations. And government is also doing enough to keep the resources available. So the survival is not the problem. But the worry is more about the businesses which are enabled by huge IT investments on premises on the cloud. And now due to this COVID-19 outbreak, the whole number of users are forced to work from home. We are seeing concerns where social media is now full of images posted by companies enthusiastically uh, displaying that uh, their people are working from home, showing the selfies. So, you know, let's start this discussion, uh, you know, uh, on how uh, and what are the impacts which are being faced uh, so let's uh, let's uh, you know start this discussion. I would like to uh, open this discussion with Kalpesh. Uh, if you can start, what is the impact uh, you are seeing with the businesses today? Hey, thanks, Ajay. Uh, the impact is serious because uh, when you look at India, uh, we not only support activities for India, we support a lot of economies and a lot of organizations across the globe. So from that perspective, the impact is serious. Uh, yes, uh, you know we are on the tipping point, which means we are seeing an increase in terms of uh, the number of infections. We have curtailed it because we started uh, the social isolation early on. So we're not seeing the impact as bad as some of the European countries. But having said that, it's not that the worst is behind us. We do not know the worst may be yet to come. So that's where we are really sitting. Uh, from an organization perspective, uh, Ajay, I believe it's going to be extremely important that we identify what are our critical processes. And there are a lot of government mandates. I think one new thing that we're seeing with pandemic are the lockdowns. Because early on, right, at least in my career, I've seen during pandemic, organizations had guidelines. And it was left to an organization, you know, sort of a decision on how they want to treat it. Today, we are seeing our governments are enforcing lockdowns, right? There are notifications in uh, Maharashtra, for, at least for Mumbai, Pune, and Nagpur, that uh, offices have to be shut down. So from that perspective, it gets extremely important and empirical for uh, CISOs to understand what are the critical processes. And as businesses would want to move a lot of activities, um, say, remote, or it would want to move them, you know, they would want to enable people to work from home. How are we going to enable them so that no matter where they work from, they are able to work securely? And as CISO, a lot of us manage certifications and regulatory requirements. How do we ensure that we don't end up breaching some of the regulatory ask and certification requirements? I think those things are very important that you know, we have to manage in the current time. It's all evolves around remote working and how do you enable them for your, your workforce uh, effectively and efficiently. Oh, yeah. So thanks a lot. Uh, so uh, Aditya, can you uh, yeah, thanks, uh, share your thoughts on that? Sure. I think uh, um, as he mentioned, you know, uh, pretty much most of the organizations are heavily impacted by this. Not everybody was actually prepared 
but the good thing is um, even our organization started prepping for this early January because of which when the situation arised out of uh, you know United States, uh, North America, as well as the India subregion, we were already prepared because we knew that this might come our way. And proactively, we had started, you know, looking at how we can provision, let's say, thin clients. What are the security uh, mitigations that should be in place? Uh, looking from a work from home perspective, there is a different threat landscape altogether. So you need to ensure are your users going to be able to print documents? If yes, then what is the business need? If not, then how do you block it? And that you ensure that it is actually working. How do you look at uh, accessing cloud um, you know, applications and what are the security that you're putting there? Do you have a plan for regression testing? Um, do you have plan for, you know, uh, the effectiveness of your endpoint agents? One other thing, uh, which is a major change from a security perspective is uh, definitely the user behavior because a user working out of office, his patterns, his, uh, you know, uh, activities would definitely differ when he's working from home. The time would definitely be erratic. So there might be a specific eight hour or nine hours when he's logging in. He might log in when it's required. He might log off. So those pattern changes actually impact any particular UB application that you're using. And how do you actually determine that you understand that and actually filter out and detect which is malicious and which is genuine. So all these changes, I think, um, a lot of organizations have been promoting work from home for a long time now. And that actually gave them the insight onto if this happens at a larger scale, how does that pattern change for the organization? How does that threat landscape change for that organization? So they could actually prepare easily. So that's, I think that's, that definitely. Yeah. Happens. So that, that's an interesting, uh, uh, you know, take on this because the user behavior has completely changed. Uh, so, uh, before we move ahead in more detailed discussion on that, uh, uh, Sundar, uh, if you could just have a few lines on what is the current impact on businesses today. Uh, you can unmute yourself. Sundar? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, you are audible now. Hello. Yes, you are audible. You are audible. All right. Yeah. So, uh, as other speakers mentioned, uh, you know, it, it's the unknown unknown. We don't know what's in the offing, and that's what the business is grappling with. As we speak every day, something new. Every minute, something new comes up, and then you have got a call, and you, and then you end up wondering how oh, you know thought of this possibility. For instance. Uh, the yesterday's lockdown was completely surprised. So entire BCP went into a tailspin because then we need to again reassemble and re rework and again do a BCP, re-BCP, re-DR. And the traditional BCP DR doesn't work in these scenarios. You know, you typically have a different lo lo location where you have replicated everything and you tested it out twice, thrice. You tested two days off etc etc but a complete lockdown like this with the kind of fear hysteria hype and uh, authorities taking arbitrary decisions like we got yesterday we fought and got uh, i mean fought in the sense that we you know requested pleaded and then said insurance services should be declared as essential services and should be open but then a branch manager is taken off by the police so in maharashtra so you, know, you would have Eventually, it is like that, which you've never imagined. And then, of course, you get fronting calls and you have to work and ensure the thing is on. You have to show the notice to him, request him. He's right. Of course, he's doing his job. Everybody is worried and uh, feel insecure. Uh, but there are many functions which can't function out of home. I mean, uh, typically, which needs collaboration, which needs decision making, which needs judgmental uh, efforts. It's very tough. Uh, there are uh, one or two companies which have managed to do investment function at home and that's unbelievable. I like my mid office that reports to me is working from home, but then the front office can't do that because they need to ask uh, what, what decisions to take, whether to sell or whether to convert to cash, keep cash, what is the view on the market. Market, as you know, yesterday went up 
but then last six seven days it was going down so you, you really don't know in this scenario how do you react and so you have to act in a very cool way get together collaborate and of course there are google hangouts there are con calls there is a zoom available like this but it doesn't work always so you'll have to sometimes get into act of uh, getting down into a conference room uh, which is what the vcp team does in such situations uh, because there are a lot of judgment involved etc etc you have to look at figures and facts uh, maybe it could also mean uh, contradicting each other and then coming to a finally a conclusion which is con- consensual and which is probably much better of better of than what we have before and that's the tough part if you see that's tcs pos uh, article today in the paper you also said the same thing you can't function everything at, at from home what about the data center how do you keep it on uh, the rest that that was you- was supposed to be my next question so my uh, question was like so as we know that the lot of normal situations have changed uh, you know and uh, it's now upon to the it and the security teams to enable a uh, lot of things work from home so i mean uh, a lot of processes have been affected so could you put up some lights on what are the processes or which kind of existing processes are being affected and uh, how uh, it things are being done or are being addressed on the work from home scenarios uh, from a uh, from a cyber security teams perspective yeah so we need to have remote access uh, to uh, data center remote access console at home to monitor network and uh, we need to so these are the things that have changed so it's no more that that going to your office console of and uh, looking at things uh, of course most of us have siem and soc soc but uh, and i've been getting mails even until yesterday but now i have to wonder what about what happened this week whether my siem would continue to give me those kind of services so that would okay the week yeah so you need to have uh, Uh, work from home consoles to do that it's not technologically uh, uh, challenge it is it is possible but we love should we should have tested it out uh, we do that at the dr site and then we leave it and then set will happen but things don't happen so easily uh, this is one change the other change is of course the phishing mails people a lot of employees get lots of videos which they would like to play because of the history of fear and hype so we've been uh, sending advisories up to advisories don't open such videos especially the covid videos you could have cyber attacks you could find one or two mails which were suspect you examining that and so we send the advisories quickly don't open videos don't open uh, you know sites and then you will land in trouble because we 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 had uh, some of the uh, colleagues in my industry have faced frauds massive amounts wherein uh, they do open video and then everything gets compromised and then they get calls and they panic and then they take Uh, the customers uh, takes stupid business decisions like one of the call that they got was that you to do a surrender uh, and then you have to pay a surrender deposit which will be refunded so one of the customers is uh, kept a deposit of 11 crores or 12 crores to get a 19 crore money and just because he had some cash flow issues otherwise a very rich customer uh, having done over 300 crores so these are the cyber attacks you could get and if you are compromised sorry you were saying something yeah so i mean uh, before we move ahead on those uh, cyber attacks i wanted to have uh, similar views from uh, kalpesh uh, and aditya so kalpesh uh, could you could you uh, advise on like what, what should be done on the work from home scenarios and how uh, how is it different from the normal situations uh, for the cyber security teams yeah i think ajay uh, work from home again uh, it all depends organization should have a remote working policy or remote access policy i'm seeing lot of organizations are struggling now to say that you no know, hey i want to enable a work from home however my networks uh, do not allow a secure vpn so those things at this moment uh, would always be on best effort basis but i really organization should have planned in advance uh, a day or two is less a time right So also like we to have to note uh, sorry yeah, so kalpesh i w- i want to ask you uh, i just stop you here and want to ask you this specific question that when you say that uh, the remote working and has to be done and when we are talking about the bcp part right uh, do you think that organizations are always prepared uh, to have a 100% or 
uh, more than 50% work from home scenarios addressed in BCP? I would, again, you know, what we are seeing is, I think Sundar rightly said, it's of a scale that we have never seen in the past. Usually, you plan for BCP for a critical resource, a count of which would usually be not more than 10 to 15 percent. Because you have to remember one thing, when you invest your money in BCP arrangements, it all comes at a cost. So it's nothing like a free lunch. And from that perspective, let's say if you're planning for a hot seat or a hot DR, it's going to cost you that, that level of amount and that level of bandwidth. So what organizations usually plan is about 10 to 15 percent. However, if it's all over the internet, you could scale it up, uh, let's say to about, you know, it depends on the type of applications that are going to exist. However, Ajay, not all applications can be accessed remotely. I'll give you certain examples where, let's say if it's a regulated data, right? Let's say somebody who's working at the call center, right? Typically, you have a lot of controls where you cannot carry a mobile and so on and so forth. Now, if you have to enable those people to work from home, we need to realize that privacy will, you know, will go out of the window, right? At the word go, because once our individual is at a home, they can take as many pics as they want. You could completely have a lockdown unit, but you can't stop that data, you know, which is important from a privacy, which is regulated to go out. So there would always be things which will have to be done from organization. And you have to identify what processes can actually be supported remotely. It will never be the case where all your processes can be done remotely, especially when you have uh, data about, you know, other customers which are governed by privacy laws. Interesting. Uh, so, Aditya, your take on this? So, uh, I largely agree with uh, the points that Sundar and Kalpesh made. However, I think uh, this is a good opportunity where organizations are actually understanding if a large amount of your people are not available in the office, how do you work? How do you ensure the continuity and the cyber resilience of your businesses? Now, uh, to the point that this was totally unanticipated i do not agree to that because uh, we knew this was happening in pretty much around november december in china we knew that there was some kind of viral infection which was going around and we started to see this as a massive stage towards the end of january so now we are in the mid of march so organizations had enough time to you know prep for this ensure how they would work and ensure how they would continue operating their businesses, at least from a technological standpoint. Because I always see this uh, excuse coming in, and not to point to anyone, this is a very generic uh, you know, statement for the security industry. Even when we had the WannaCry vulnerability, everybody was running around like headless chickens, and looking at that, that they never expected this to happen, whereas that vulnerability was there for a long time. You just didn't ensure that you fix this, and take precautionary steps. And the same thing we are seeing again over here now. So I think it's the responsibility of, you know, not just the CISO, but also the CTO, uh, the different, uh, you know, stakeholders of their businesses to ensure how your BCPDR works. When you have a natural calamity or any huge uh, public unrest in a particular region, you do not get a notification of, you know, 10 days or a week prior to that. It just happens. So you have to actually react to it in real time. So I think organizations are going to understand that how important BCPDR is, how important providing that flexibility to your users to work remotely is, and how you can still ensure that your business continues. Because a lot of organizations are doing it in a fantastic manner. A lot of organizations are really struggling. As I can see in the group chat also, people are asking questions about certain organizations as to why they are still you know, working from offices. So I think, to be very honest, uh, you can take any technological company like uh, TCS Infosys, any organization. They provide their services to a large number of dependent organizations. These might include government services, public health care, hospitals. So we really cannot shut down all of our offices because there's a larger downstream impact that might happen. And just because a company in India or a company in North America is now not functioning, your hospitals in Europe can actually go down from an IT perspective. So we need to look at the bigger picture there is definitely a risk associated with it. But as uh, I think uh, Sundar mentioned previously, that there are you know, 
IT services like data centers and various other services, where even if you go to cloud, you still need to have some kind of presence, maybe in the office, to ensure that your services are being deployed and operationalized correctly. So I think that's uh, yeah. as individuals, so, we need to look at the larger picture as well. So that's great. So I mean, so here comes my next question to you, uh, Aditya, is that uh, as you have been working specifically on the technologies, I wanted to understand out here that how are the existing cybersecurity technologies being, uh, you know, already purchased by the organizations or, or in the process of purchased uh, or they have already procured it. Mm -hmm. Are they really helping uh, or I mean, so the point is that are the investments in the cybersecurity done or the decisions taken to invest on those cybersecurity has been helpful in keeping the uh, existing business and processes secure or it's still lacking or still more to be done? So I think uh, it again comes down to the maturity of the organization and how well they have assessed their business requirements. Um, fortunately, our organization had been looking at work from home uh, from a very liberal perspective. So we had at least a big chunk of our people actually working from home even before any of this started. That was the, you know, how it actually functions as an organization. And even we provide the flexibility that if somebody wants to work from home for a week because uh, you know they're not feeling well or they have some immediate requirement, they can actually do that. So we predominantly understood how our users will uh, you know, uh, be looked at from a technology standpoint when they're working from home. How do they connect to their VPNs? How are they uh, you know, requesting accesses or how are they requesting a new token when they're not in the office? Or how are they resolving their IT issues? Because again, IT support is something that we need 24 by seven, 365 days, especially in conditions like this. Because right now, if I'm not able to log in into my Splunk, I need to get it resolved as soon as possible. I cannot wait, I cannot you know, travel to office and get it fixed. So technology, uh, from a technology standpoint, yes, uh, the organization already had a lot of different technologies in place. I would not take the name of it, but from a maturity standpoint, I think uh, we were looking at UBA, we were looking at uh, understanding uh, from you know, a proxy standpoint, uh, we were looking at uh, URL filtering, we were looking at all of these technologies and they have been working well. But since now everybody has worked from home, the volume has increased. So whereas we might had an acceptable level of 5% fault ratio, now that is you know, turning out to be 25%. So that's okay. definitely a huge impact. But okay. one of the good things that we did as an organization was we did it on a phase-by-phase -phase basis. So not everybody went work from home on day one. We had a larger chunk go at one day, then we had another you know, team getting into work from home another day. So that gave us the time and gave us uh, the ability to mature our services as we move to a full work from home globally. Well, that's a good insight uh, moving into phase uh, by phase by phase uh, towards the maturity. So uh, uh, Kalpesh, I would just like to spice this thing up. So this is the view of a technologist who is uh, handling the technology on, on the ground. But uh, from a CISO perspective, is, is this the same scenario for you or uh, the view is different. And then I'll come down to Sundar to ask the same question from a business angle. So, uh, Kalpesh, uh, uh, please go on. Sure. Uh, Ajay, I think it's similar. Important is uh, how are we investing as an organization? Uh, Aditya did mention, you know, that the factors we had to plan ahead. Fortunately for us, uh, we had applications. We used to give a lot of laptops to our users. So most of our people have laptops, which can then be used to work from home. Our applications were all integrated through a single sign-on. Our critical applications have two-factor authentication, which means if you have to access them, there are those controls in place. Uh, we use a, you know, we use hardening. So whitelisting is very, very strong, which means no matter where you are, you cannot install, you cannot really do anything about it. We have strong controls for internet proxy, which means no, you know, we have the agent on the systems itself. Uh, you cannot access any other sites than what the organization has approved it. And I think finally, uh, we, you know, there is a need where you can update your, uh, your malware or your endpoint protection, uh, you know, whenever you're connected to the internet, it's extremely important because you don't want to give away or you don't want to, you know, uh, be losing on your defense. 
in terms of the signatures and everything. So that's going okay. to be very important. And uh, yes, UEBA is also important. Uh, I'm not sure how much of it can really come into play, but yes, you do want to monitor activities of users, especially uh, privileged users. So, you know, your PEM, your correlation is important. One more important thing uh, that organizations should do is your SOC teams, right? Uh, we can't have SOC team, which is limited only to your office location. They need to have remote uh, availability. Same thing for your IT work, you know, your help desk and critical functions. You need to have an ability for them to connect remotely and manage that critical infrastructure, regardless of where they're sitting. Last thing is concentration risk. I think we often forget the fact uh, there's a common saying, and I think, you know, all wise men, you know, for ages, your parents would have said that, do not put all your eggs in one basket, right? We overlook it uh, many a times, but it's important that if you have a concentration risk, concentration risk means if all your resources are at one location, then your risk or your chances or likelihood of you being impacted severely is always going to be significantly high then, uh, you know, your other counterparts. So as a CISO, uh, you have to make sure that your critical functions or especially all your functions and teams, there is a, you do not ha have a huge concentration risk and you have balanced teams across. So those are some things, you know, that I believe are important. Ajay, okay. over to you. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, so Sundar, what is your take on the, uh, you know, on this uh, from a business and the risk angle? Actually, I was uh, when I was speaking when initially spoke to you clearly from a business perspective. Uh, technologically and ideally, yes, it's possible to manage this crisis, uh, saying that you can work from home, and uh, there are there are technologies available for remote access. We had a remote access policy to tested, uh, audited, etc. But the point is, the business side of it is a very different animal, uh, you know, and the risk side. I'm only coming from business risk perspective, not from purely technological risk. So the business side, like for cash collections, we are a, we're a forty percent cash company, so cash collections are impacted. Then there is this the sales work. It's a sales centric uh, industry in the insurance industry, and uh, especially life insurance. So uh, it's in the general insurance. It's possible to go fully online. One of my uh, group companies, there's 65 percent online. So it's not impacted much, but still that 30 percent impact is a big one. And so you will have to look at the scenario, infrastructure, culture, and many things. People don't buy. Uh, you have to change people's habits, culture also in this case. How do you? How do they react? Work uh, by living at home? Do they still go about purchasing? They'll say, last thing I'll do is insurance. I'm not getting my groceries. So, so he, you know, these are things. So we, we, do, we do our processes like telecalling, do it over the phone, click, give a browser, click, sell on, online, but it doesn't work. And then worst is, again, if you have a large organization like mine, 800 branches and 850 branches and then some like 12,000 odd employees, how do you ensure they work? And what is the reporting system? Uh, and it's not that we were not prepared. We knew it's coming, uh, you know, in Jan or even before that, the BCPs have already factored it in. We had a crisis simulation on the COVID-19 uh, at least two months back. But nobody still, I didn't expect a 100% lockdown. No, 50 is something you have you had budgeted for, you planned for 100% lockdown. It's there theoretically in the BCP and DR and it technologically works. But from a business side, it's a problem. It's an impact. Investments function, for instance, right? There is a lot of regulatory requirements. You need to record, you need to have slips, you need to do count party. So you have to rush to the regulator to get lots of dispensations in many, many aspects. Now, yesterday we got the dispensation night at 12 o'clock from the chief minister uh, saying that uh, declare insurance as essential services. So if you see the BMC order originally would not contain insurance services. So this is what it's a backup, 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 and then you do plan B, plan C, plan D, and then finally, of course, it has an impact on business. And so uh, you always keep on having a BCP for a BCP for plan. Yes, yes, and the okay. business impact is very high, uh, but of course, things will change for the better. I mean, I'm not pessimistic, uh, and of course, as other speakers said, it's a good lesson learned in terms of you know, uh, most of my functions were all all of my guys are working from home. 
So what uh, so they I, would always I would like working. to ask you a, a question out here, uh, Sundar, is that so do you think uh, that uh, the uh, the CISOs and the security teams have become uh, are, are becoming a successful business enablers, or do you see any lag in this? Uh, no, I would say they are enablers uh, because uh, a couple of uh, initiatives that we took long back paid off and it enabled the business, like Aadhaar based authentication of the customer. Of course, to Supreme Court stuck down. We had given tokens to our sales and then we were ma we managed to issue policies in two minutes. But once the Supreme Court stuck down, then we had the plan B, plan C. And then the plan, we are now using the QR code. And during this, uh, and during this migration or this transition, the security teams uh, uh, were capable enough to handle the change. Yeah, yeah in, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And in this current scenarios of the pandemic, also the security teams so are. I I had risk compliance, legal security, and all my teams are able to function well because we always were working. We had this work to to work from home, remote access policy. But the point is a business, sales, and uh, and then the crisis meetings that you have. Uh, the investments function, cash collection, branch, branch sales, these are impacted. Uh, I don't think we factored the business impact of to be so high or so serious uh, uh, in the BCB planning, d despite crisis relations. And the problem I mean, on this point, I would like to come down to Kalpesh on this. So Kalpesh, I mean, uh, the concern which is coming up here is that uh, though the technology and the security teams have been a good enablers, but uh, in a lot of cases, uh, you know, the sales teams were continuously on the move and which has always been an issue, the secure, cyber security issue that how do you protect uh, or how do you enable them uh, from a cyber security perspective is what one of the major questions uh, the, for the teams which are on the move, the teams which are, uh, are on, the, uh, on the remote locations. And that's the major concerns because uh, uh, this was never, of course, factored that the 100% of your sales teams and the uh, uh, remote working teams will be have to be there, uh, uh, you know, working uh, in in silos, right? So, how do you see this as, and how do you think? Uh, because uh, there are questions which are we seeing that uh, uh, you know the people who are working uh, through the homes they do not have an advanced firewall, right? So, how do you think that the teams like such who are on sales who are handling a lot of data? Uh, are going to uh, make sure, or a security team is going to make sure that, that uh, this data is not leaked and is readily available to the people whenever needed. I think Ajay, end of the day, we are dealing with a situation you know, where we have to take certain risks. People who will have data, and I'm also seeing some questions coming, you know, by our some of our uh, participants and uh, some of the leaders in you know for part of this participant, you know, the participants. We have, we do not have an option, right? We have to have business to continue. When we have business to continue, there are certain risks. What if a person who is encrypted any which ways to have the data, what if they misuse, what if you know they inadvertently go about uh, uh, either copying them in the wrong place or pick, take the pictures and everything? Those things are real, right? We can't take it away. However, we have to see where all can technology intervene. Right, so purely from that perspective, uh, we need to fine tune our uh, sim, our correlation, and find out uh, you know are we seeing any patterns which really depict that the pattern is not normal. Look at the behavior, user behavior. There are tools that can capture a lot of data, especially for all your critical resources who have been enabled. You can monitor their activities and you could track them very closely to make sure that uh, there is no advertent or you know, there is no malice in terms of the user behavior. One more very important uh, thing is about inadvertent, which is a human error. That's where I believe as CISOs or as security professionals, awareness plays a very important role. Sundar mentioned about you know a lot of phishing attacks. I can personally vouch on that, that the amount of attacks which are you know the phishing and the spam mails have grown up significantly. So awareness will play a very dominant role. As CISOs, you'll have to educate your users. We do not have an option. They are going to work uh, away. They are going to be you know, taking their own calls. So do ensure that apart from BCP, you also send security awareness. You talk about the behavior parts of it. You make sure they do not become a victim of social engineering attacks. 
I think uh, that would really help you in combination with your enhanced uh, monitoring in terms of your SIM, in terms of your UEB activities, or even your logs. When they are privileged users, monitor their activity very closely to be sure that they're not doing anything untoward. You can track at the level of is somebody trying to access a database, dropping a database, trying to modify a database. Those critical commands will have to be watched very, very closely. Over to you, Ajay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I was up uh, so before we move ahead, so I mean, just I wanted to ask Aditya. Uh, so I mean, as we see most of the cybersecurity technologies which have been procured in past, uh, many of them are on uh, on premises, and a lot of technology procurements were also on premise. Uh, do you think, uh, from a security standpoint, uh, had uh, people started focusing on uh, moving to cloud or investing on cloud security? would have helped better to look into this kind of crisis or tackle this crisis? Absolutely. I think uh, this question is on point because a lot of people uh, in the chat were discussing the same thing that uh, why are we not moving towards the cloud? I think digital transformation in the last couple of years has been a really hot topic with most uh, CIOs and CTOs. And uh, from a security standpoint, I think it's a very good use case uh, where we can actually move from an on-premise uh, you know, enforcement to looking at cloud services because it not only provides you with high availability, but also in situations like this, it provides you with the reliability and uh, gives your employees that access so that they can actually work remotely and still provide uh, you know, all the due diligence and due care that is expected of them. Um, I think uh, most technologies that we use in larger organizations from a security perspective have a cloud option available. Uh, cost is something that is uh, definitely uh, you know, one of the factors because of which not all organizations are going for it. The other is uh, how do you manage the responsibilities in a cloud environment? Because there's a differentiation when you are hosting an application on the cloud or taking it as a service. Uh, a lot of the responsibilities are actually shared. And how do you understand them? How do you encapsulate the risk associated with them? And how do you then again set up BCP in place if that particular cloud but provider those are, goes those down? Are the standard, uh, see, those are the standard concerns when we are talking about uh, moving an application to the cloud or, uh, you know, onboarding in any new application, which is cloud based, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but uh, my concern, which I would like to address out here is that, uh, is it really would be helpful or, you know, this is a similar situation or would have been much better that uh, the things have been on cloud? I think it would have been much better. So, um, yeah. Definitely. It would have been much better. It would have been uh, easier on the employees as well as on the organizations uh, and their heads in managing the situation if we had most of our services uh, from the cloud as a service. So over to you, Sundar. The question is now that uh, as it would have been, uh, do, you, do you also think uh, from a risk perspective that it would have been better to be on cloud? And uh, what do you foresee as in the upcoming times that after this uh, crisis situation will uh, do you think there will be a spike on the cloud adoption uh, yeah, by the def businesses <clears throat> definitely uh, i've been mean, uh, much before that uh, as uh, aditya pointed out two years before itself you know we will uh, slowly slowly migrating things to cloud uh, because it's on prem experience whatever it is the audits after audits point out so many gaps it's not that we just want to outsource the gaps to some service provider but Looking at basically specialized cloud service providers who were up the curve, who probably top the charts in Gartner or whatever. So, you know, you, you look at proven uh, cloud service provider with good experience, good security, advanced features. So, and of course, cheaper. And therefore, it makes sense to outsource. Uh, earlier, the thought process was cloud outsourcing to cloud was a problem. Regulatory constraints were there, but now even the regulators are with you as long as there is a server co-located in India and logs are available. So you, when you look at this decision, you have to, of course, carefully look at all regulatory aspects, uh, security aspects, retrievability aspects, uh, very carefully. I know the clauses with the service provider uh, legally also, and then uh, go for it. 
course, all the cost pros and cons and cost benefit analysis. But in the end, I think cloud outsourcing to cloud services would go up even after this. This is even more important. Uh, now we're looking at even giving laptops to all the employees. It's been an, uh, so we, we did have desktops. So the laptop costs have gone up as we speak. Uh, and the uh, laptop hiring charges have also gone up. Suddenly uh, the desktops have price. become obsolete. <laughs> and so, no, so what we've done the last day, yesterday in the night, so frantically, people have taken desktops home. So to people who do not have laptops. <laughs> there is also the problem of uh, putting in the security features. So you just buy and then start using, no, we, we don't do that. So we'll have to up upload all the security tools. The guy who uploads is scarce. So it's not easy. This is what I meant by these things were never thought. In the BCP. So these, are, these are the types of incident scenarios uh, today the cybersecurity teams should be planning for. So, uh, uh, Alpesh, could you highlight uh, similar kinds of incidents which you are seeing uh, on which uh, the uh, cybersecurity uh, team should be planning their incident response or crisis management on? So, one of the examples which just Sundar gave is that uh, you, just, you cannot just buy out a new laptop and uh, give it to an employee to use it from home. I mean, you have to enable with all the security features uh, before you Software. give it to and that, that does take time. So, I mean, uh, Kalpesh, what's your take on that? I agree here. You have to plan ahead. So there is no, uh, no, there is no shortcut in terms of planning. And um, end of the day, you know, when you are enabling people to work from home, you'll have to pay, ensure that they have the right softwares, you have the right images, you have the right controls. So you can't really take the shortcuts. I and think we any, covered, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and any more incidents which you foresee that there will be, uh, we should be looking at uh, uh, from working from home scenarios. I believe uh, Sundar did hint and I've seen a lot of IT companies doing that. Uh, laptops are scarce. Uh, people who do not have laptops, uh, organizations, I've seen large IT organizations, they're allowing their people to carry their desktops to their homes. So I believe that trend will continue. I don't see that changing at all. Right? Uh, 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 Ajay, uh, now I'm thinking about this scenario. What happens to a quarantined person? <laughs> how, do, how do we take care of his needs? Oh, okay. oh, I, I think this is exact. Uh, I'm just sorry. to add to that, uh, also when you're giving out your official uh, you know, desktops to a particular employee, when it is coming back, how do you ensure that it is actually in a state where it can be really plugged in? Yes. Because uh, it has been out of your organization. You don't know what has happened with it. You don't know if there are any hardware changes. And to validate every desktop and then connect it to a network is again going to be taking a long time gap. Yeah, my network resource has been working 18 hours now, 18, 20 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Aditya, you put out a very good point out here that after it comes back, I mean, how do I ensure that uh, uh, nothing has changed in my machines uh, uh, from the perspective? So have you seen any kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, technologies which are currently deployed with the organizations uh, which can cater to this issue? I think uh, and then I'll I come out with the other technologies, uh, uh, how, it, how it will confirm. So I mean, just before you uh, yeah. go ahead. Ajay, there is a real time asset management, you know, uh, applications available. So it monitors your, you know, your hardware or your system in real time. And in case there are changes, somebody makes a hardware change. Somebody tries to, you know, fiddle with your environment. It will give an alert on that. So I have seen companies doing that as well. Okay. So they install that and that takes care. That you know, so does is, is this requirement you have seen it recently, which is coming recently. up? Or this is, recently. Okay, well, that's an interesting one. Uh, there is another concerns uh, like say as the people are going ahead and uh, giving uh, work from home for supporting the BCPs and all. One of the major challenges which we are seeing that uh, that there is a pretty good scares in the uh, laptops, desktops uh, to be available and companies are enabling. Uh, the users or the employees, uh, their own personal machines and uh, the companies which had not catered to the BYOD scenarios, now they are going ahead and giving them the capability that they can uh, use the company resources through their own machines. Now one of the first question is, uh, a couple of concerns which I have out here is that how do you control the browsing activities? How do you control the communication of the critical information among the employees because you are not just a shout out away. Your manager is not a shout out away today, right? 
so uh, these are two major concerns and uh, the third concern is what is the about the uh, uh, for the privileged users how do you think i mean we have uh, technologies to monitor privileged users but today uh, the privileged users are going uh, 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 on the remote locations or work from home so how do you uh, look into those uh, and how the technologies can be used to enable such scenarios i think uh... I'll, I'll take the stab at this uh, first. So um, I think uh, for at least privileged users or people who are having access to your crown jewels and high value targets, uh, they should be prioritized to be provided with the company assets to be used. Because if you're looking at uh, me being using my home laptop for office work, uh, there's a whole set of things that I should be putting in place, which the organization somehow has to enforce. So connecting to a VPN and then going into your enterprise network is just one of those checks, but there's a lot of different aspects that you need to take care of. Do you have strong passwords in place? Do you have a two factor authentication? Is your VPN connectivity working absolutely fine? Because in VPN, there's a lot of different aspects altogether. Like how many concurrent users are you having throughout the enterprise logging into your VPN at the same time? Um, how do you accommodate extra employees who are actually logging in, which is going to take you past your bandwidth limit? How do you prioritize the access of the applications uh, that cannot be supported for everyone? And typically, how much bandwidth are you providing to a you know normal user or a user who is not a you know a priority at this point in time as per the business requirements? Uh, next is the firewall, uh, antivirus, basic stuff like, is your router secured? Do you have updates on your operating system? Uh, do you have access to the enterprise backup? Um, do you have any remote desktop applications on your computer? So all of these things actually increase the threat landscape like four times and enforcing those on a personal device is very challenging. So. In case you're having employees who are actually critical to the business from a access standpoint, we should definitely uh, prioritize in providing them with official uh, devices rather than going at a, you know, a BYOD. Um, That's interesting. I, I didn't catch the second part of your question. Uh, the second, but, uh, so one of the other part was, uh, how do you control the browsing activities and the communication of critical information? That's correct. So uh, I think uh, everybody has a lot of different applications already installed uh, in their uh, computers. So, right. So um, anybody else wants to take a stab at that? Yeah. So uh, what we do is uh, we, we have this procedure of morning login and uh, we've already done that long back and then log off and then there is scroll graph. Then there is a spreadsheet of activity. Uh, of course, spreadsheet, spreadsheet gets into mundane, but these are uh, very thought through and then precise. Uh, so that, you know, the data is very useful. It's not just for monitoring. At the same time, it's also for decision making. Uh, the sales, especially sales businesses work that way. You have crawl graphs of plan versus actual budget, forecast, plan B, plan C, crisis, etc. The red, amber, green. So we look at these things and uh, that actually gives you exactly what is happening on the ground. And then we dig, dig deep dive, dig through, and then find out, okay, this place, this this problem is peculiar. This place, this problem is prob uh, issue. This place, the branch manager was taken uh, by the police uh, take a, and locked up or whatever, whatever. Then sales went down because of that. So, uh, so this is very, very uh, important. How do you uh, have a mechanics of tracking and monitoring? Uh, without, without being uh, uh, very, uh, you know, uh, encroaching the privacy or uh, or being uh, too tough but at the same time you have to balance it out motivation also is key we do claps uh, we do send mails things saying congrats great job done good work target achieved and things like that so you know in a sales organization important. very important yeah motivation levels are very down now because the challenges are enormous because suddenly you know jfm is one of the most important months of sales organization january february march and in one of the year, we did 33% of our sales on the March 31st. The entire year sale, one day, is 33%. It's, it's crazy. It's, there's no science to this. It's all adrenaline and, you know, the bravado to achieve the target. And that week you have 100% lockdown is something unimagined in any of the BCPs of insurance companies. But, I can challenge uh, but at you this that. point, uh, just uh, Sundar, I would like to move on to Kalpesh. 
Uh, sure. So, uh, what uh, we were discussing on the technologies front. Uh, Kalpesh, one uh, question to you out here is that uh, as the threat landscape has increased, uh, how are you managing the detection of the vulnerabilities and the patching of it? And, uh, you know, how do we control that activity that the systems are continuously updated? As I said, uh, Ajay, uh, you have to increase your uh, monitoring. There are newer threats, uh, especially, you know, with spams and phishing happening around COVID. So your SOC will have to really scale up and make sure that, you know, you are able to curtail, you are able to block them at your, you know, at your perimeter level. Most important again would be the fact uh, it's about user awareness. You have to ensure that your users are aware. And from a technology perspective, make sure that whenever you are allowing people to work from home, your applications are secure. Only people who need to have access. I think it's again a high time when you revisit your access, who has access to your applications, critical uh, devices, do not have any shared drives. I think once we go through the hygiene factors, you are going to realize that uh, we're good. We also have a benchmark. Before we allow anybody uh, to connect remotely, they need to be sure, or before we make an application available online, they have to undergo certain uh, checks. We call them as uh, systems acceptance tests where uh, they have to be all patched. Your servers have to be all patched. We can't have somebody accessing it remotely when your server has a lot of vulnerabilities. So you need to ensure that what they are going to access is secure at the end of the day. You need to ensure that people who are connecting are the right people. Organizations, we've seen many people would have access you know, to a lot of applications that they don't, don't use at all. Those threats are there. Your system could be compromised. But as we so, as we speak about, uh, so where you were saying that uh, we have to uh, enforce complete uh, uh, monitoring, we need to focus on uh, creating a benchmark of cybersecurity hygiene. Uh, there are concerns which are raised, uh, Sundar, which is on the privacy. And uh, you will agree in this that uh, while we are talking about the cybersecurity to protect the data. Uh, the privacy is getting affected to a certain extent. So how do you think we can handle this uh, along with cybersecurity? Uh, this question is to? Uh, Sundar. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, um, see, so legally what you do is, of course, you take concerns uh, of before and, and then uh, work on that very specific concerns, obviously, to meet the GDPR standards and record them. And of course, uh, every time you do something which touches the privacy, you'll have to take, uh, no, you'll have to inform the person that we're doing this, we're doing this, hope you understand and why we're doing it. The rationale of that is explained properly. Uh, that, that's one way to do. The other way is to not intervene too much. And uh, you, you say, for instance, you have the, we have this feature of uh, the sales, um, especially in the morning, they have this, uh, necessarily coming into office uh, giving attendance. Now with this breakout, they'll have to do it online, uh, real time and then Wi-Fi uh, kind of scenario. So uh, how do you, uh, then they have to give some record of what they have done, the activity, etc. So that that that's a better way to do manage or control rather than getting into what he's done, where, what, how. Uh, getting the into the, so the cybersecurity and the privacy teams now need to start working together uh, yeah, there has to be. All, it's always collaborative. It's, it's very, very important. Great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so over to every Aditya. script, every sales script is reviewed by me uh, because I have to be careful on the legal side, compliance side, especially if my sales guys are going to ask questions over the phone to the customer. I'll have to be ensure it's compliant. Uh, right kind of disclaimers are made, etc., etc., etc. Otherwise, there will be so many uh, um, uh, complaints. The complaints will go up uh, on the business side. So, we'll have, so it's a, it's not a more anymore a silo function, it's a collaborative. Interesting. Uh, so Aditya, over to you. I would like to uh, now, uh, before we uh, open the uh, conversations to the public for the questions, and I'll start picking up the questions from the, uh, which are mentioned on the tweets. Uh, one last thing I would want you to do is uh, bust some misconceptions which are there uh, in the name of the, uh, at the employees that, uh, for example, uh, that working from Starbucks is work from home or uh, the things like uh, changing of the passwords on the Wi-Fi, um, not making the SSID available. So mm -hmm. what are the such kind of misconceptions which you would you like to bust out here and uh, 
uh, you know, create some kind of a checklist uh, uh, with you and uh, Kalpesh together? Sure. So um, on the Starbucks question, uh, I think definitely uh, working from Starbucks is not a work from home because you're surrounded by strangers. Uh, you might be connected to a Starbucks Wi-Fi, which is not a secured one or uh, authorized one as per the enterprise. So we definitely should be cautious that, you know, although we are in a situation where the business is struggling to make both men's meet, as an employee, you're struggling to, you know, uh, maintain your numbers and ensure that you are actually completing your work and being productive. Uh, we need to also ensure that uh, we are part of an organization. And if one employee even breaks that particular chain or, you know, maintains some kind of practices through which the organization is at risk, then we'll have a larger concern because now you have to deal with a security issue on top of the pandemic. So I think locking your system, being in a secured area, especially being in an area where uh, you are able to work. Uh, I know in the Indian subdomain, you know, working from home is a huge challenge. At least everybody from my team is not happy with the work from home because they have kids at home. They have, uh, you know, music playing. They have all of these different distractions. So it becomes a little difficult, but uh, I think, what you would not do in the office is something definitely that you should not be doing at home. And you should be treating work from home as an extension of how you would behave in the office. So I would say try to maintain a similar schedule, a get up, a get ready, a get on your calls. From a mental perspective and a social perspective, I just wanted to bring out uh, one part. I know this is the last question, so I'm just bringing it out now. Um, I think as a security leaders, everybody should focus at the technical aspects, but they should also uh, focus at the people aspect. Try to connect with your people and try to ensure that you're having that one-to-one -one connection. You're ensuring that you're giving them the visibility and the attention that they normally get in the office. So ensure and that- Just to add one more thing, uh, yes. before you share any information, make sure you call up that guy and confirm that uh, he has requested the information so that you don't fall prey to the precinct attacks absolutely so um, as you know uh, Kalpesh and Sundar both mentioned that uh, some of the security issues that we are going to face right now and we are actually facing are spear phishing and social engineering so there are different attackers with different campaigns which are coming out I just heard today in the morning in North America there's a uh, you know group of hackers who are actually calling up people uh, pretending to be from Microsoft uh, you know and Zscaler and different organizations and they're actually asking for credentials to ensure that they have the connectivity so oh. ensure if you're receiving a call or you're receiving an email uh, validate it's correct uh, from the correct person and the information that you're giving out is adequate and to the correct person so coming back uh, to the other point that I was discussing in, ensure that you're actually speaking with your employees ensure if they're traveling um, outside uh, which place they are going. So if somebody is traveling back to Mumbai or Pune, uh, be a little cautious of that because the cities are on lockdown and uh, we tentatively don't want people to, you know, uh, go out to those locations. Um, are any of your employees sick? If yes, there is a government mandate where you actually need to report that. So keeping in touch with your employees is very important. The other thing that, uh, you know, I and the organization is doing is we are conducting virtual happy hours so it's a weekly event where, you know, we are getting everybody on the call, uh, preferably on a Friday, you know, end of the day, near to the end of the day, so that some of them can at least crack a beer open. They can talk about where they're working from. They can share some bits. Uh, they can talk about the pets that they have. So the only thing is, see, uh, we are talking about social distancing, but in reality, it's actually physical distancing. We can still be social and we should be social because everybody is working remotely. They might feel depressed. They might feel lonely. And that will not only impact that particular employee's morale, but actually impact the entire team. So ensure that you're connecting and uh, there's no reason not to have fun and to connect with people. So when we talk about connecting, uh, Kalpesh, uh... Uh, what do you think uh, by connecting and communicating, what will be the efforts uh, companies will have to add now from the security awareness perspective? I think important over here is awareness because so far, every organization or every CISO 
has you know given a lot of instructions on what to do when you're in the company premise when individuals work from home and have we've seen there are very challenges there are new ways of doing your job is going to be extremely important that you set up the new rules yes public internet is not a safe internet right so it doesn't mean that work from home means working from a cyber cafe or work from home means connecting to a three you know free public network or internet and do your job you have to be secure you have to take a lot of precautions security awareness is going to play a dominant role right so you know, when you have peer phishing typically what happens is when you are in an office premise it's easy to communicate is easy to pass on the information when you have people who are spread across right and uh, when you do not have a direct touch with them uh, and all, all the things you going to do is connect with them you know through internet and through technology it's extremely important that you you fine tune your workforce on what are the new ways of looking at things and how do you ensure that they remain secure and they do not become a victim so that's going to be really important right i know i'm i'm the one standing between the questions the questions and uh, you know the panel yeah, discussion so stand over now here we, now we I'll open now we close over here yeah exactly right so now now we open up on the questions uh, can i have the show of hands uh, or uh, shubham can you pick up questions for the panelists so, so that uh, we can answer on that i think i i could see a lot of questions been asked so you know somebody can just start reading out the questions or i know we haven't answered the question so my again request should be the ones who are on the call if they can ask the question once more that would really help us uh, to know address them so one of the questions which i saw uh, was that uh, uh, that should organizations pay for the faster internet connection and the greater data cap for employees working from home um i think that's a business question uh, sundar your take on this yes i answer is yes so you need to increase uh, at time side the data cap but then the security is very important uh the sweet answer is your, yes. i think ajay my take on this is most of our applications today are accessed over the browser so they are they are compressed and you know, they're not really hungry on your resources unless and until you are in the industry you know where you really move a huge uh, you know chunk of data yeah. so i think you'll have to be cognizant of the fact that people don't use you know to upgrade their plans to 1 gb and make the organization pay for it we are going to look at a bad year we're going to look at decreased uh, margins yes. so it should not be misused i think uh, just to add to that the problem is not the applications itself uh, being uh, you know bandwidth hungry but when you connect to a vpn how is that impacting your speed because there's a considerable uh, reduction in the speed after you connect through a vpn so if your vpn is actually not uh, you know eating a lot of bandwidth and still providing access to applications at a good speed i think it shouldn't be a problem okay i can see, i can see a question let me go with that uh, it's a question from uh, venkata satish uh, gutula sorry if i you know pronounce your name wrongly how can you just take backup of the data when working from home when usb is disabled and upload feeds up pathetic at home are they they want to take this so sure. so uh, i think usb uh, should definitely be blocked so uh, that's a yeah. good practice but um, however uh, what i feel is if you have any uh, important information which you need access to from time to time for your uh, bau activities uh, you have to take that to the computer or the laptop that you're using um, i don't think there's a you know constructive um, alternative to that because as a organization we do recommend that all of the uh, work related information should be on the cloud backup instead of your computer device uh, alone but whatever you need access to again and again should be on your computer rather than on your cloud and you can do a sync at the end of the day to ensure that you have the backup on the cloud also Mom. stopping uh, you know some of the applications which are bandwidth hungry at times when you need yes. access or download those data uh, that can be done so that is what i do i have a lot of different applications running in the background which i would but, stop but, at but the i would just want like to stop with yes. yours you said that uh, you know stopping the applications which are resource hungry 
uh, for a normal employee from an accounts department would not be aware of such things. And uh, that's where the point of the monitoring comes into picture, where we need right. to monitor the resources and the resource consumption of each devices, which is happening. And that's where the activity of the monitoring really increases. So, so I, I am so saying no. like, if you have a web browser open, if you have a, uh, you know, a Slack or WebEx open, if you have a video call going on, that is not the correct time to, you know, download that file from your cloud storage. You should actually close all of them and then download it. That would be much easier given that the speed is not yeah. up to the mark. That's I think I'm suggesting. Just no, to so this, this calls for a comprehensive review of business apps because you need to find out which apps uh, use a lot of data. One, two. Also look at ways and means of recording more and more information directly on the app rather than at, uh, rather than at home. So the question is that how do I save my work if I do some recording, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And therefore, uh, the, the user feels that is the data that he has uh, worked upon is not being recorded in the app, and that's a problem. That calls oh. for a review of the business apps and. Uh, uh, they are not necessarily tailored to uh, situations of work from home. Yeah. Therefore, we need to look at uh, customizations. There. Let so, me add a different dimension to this. A lot of times, I've seen the user, you know, request for backups, right? And a lot of those requests, when we have to challenge them, I've seen majority of the times users have agreed to work without the backups, right? <laughs> so we need to realize at times it's a human tendency. I want everything with me now, right? When things are different, your work styles will change. And uh, it's not about what you feel happy about it. It's during these times is what is absolutely necessary. And can we go ahead with it? So for at least for so, us, we have a strong business certification that need to be put a simple control. We say, if you believe this is so important, get your interest to approval, right? And 70% uh, of the people do not come back to us after that. So they the have next to question. What they have. People yes, have to uh, be adaptable to the changing circumstances. Right. So, so the next question, Kalpesh, was what you just spoke upon has just come up, has, has come up earlier as well. That uh, when we talk about such things, that uh, the employees can take their data uh, either in writing down or taking pictures from the laptops. So, in such cases, what is the data theft can be prevented when they are on working from home? Yeah. I think simple things. Ajay, I mentioned that at the start of it. If your company deals with regulated data, it deals with production data, right? You need to be sure, right? And if it's regulated, we uh, we ourselves were you know having a look at it. Some of your processes cannot be uh, taken out of your office premises, so those people would be compelled to work from office. And we'll have to limit. If you have to really do it, you have to ensure that people are doing it. You have to put an element of trust on them, but uh, do make sure. You reiterate their commitments. You reiterate uh, their you know, responsibilities and their obligations so that the data is not misused. When a person sits at home, I can have no control on what they can click in terms of a photo. Even they can do a video shooting. We can't really control that. No technology has a control there. End of the day, it would be trust. End of the day, it is letting them know every fraud has a tried, right? Which means my ability to do a crime uh, and my ability of, you know, what will the replications if my crime is caught. So as a CISO, we let them know that while your ability to do a crime uh, is easy, uh, the chances of you being caught will always be high because today anything which is leaked, uh, you know, it's easy to find out how it's leaked and the replications of that would cost them their career and then and can also mean legal actions. So you have to really educate them and let them know that they do they do not become communication is the key of a greed yeah a greed will overtake them so that's where communication awareness will play a dominant role how can a technology stop somebody from taking a photo impossible right so just, here comes the next question add uh, to that ajay uh, yeah. one point i wanted to add so any employee who has a laptop even in normal circumstances can actually do all of this we are only looking at the aggregated situation right now because everybody is working from home so as kalpesh mentioned you need to make sure that your employees understand that there are monitoring uh, applications in place any fraud that happens by any means will be tracked audited and there will be you know actions taken so there will be a result of any fraud that happens. So I think consistently getting that message across and making sure that the people understand that security is working, is looking, 
and is maintaining a record of everything that you're doing uh, definitely goes a long way because ultimately you have to trust your employees with the data. Right. So there is another question which is just raised uh, by Jatin. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll just unmute uh, Jatin and uh, you can uh, pitch your question. Uh, yes, hi Jatin, everybody. Thanks for. Uh, Jatin, I'm not able to hear you. Okay, let me do one thing. I will uh, read out the question. Could, if, yeah, we could hear him briefly. So, yeah. So let let me pick up a question uh, for Jatin. Uh, he said that the 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 situations which we were talking about were purely on large enterprises uh, where they have a huge amount of security resources. But what about the um, uh, medium, micro, small, medium enterprises uh, and uh, uh, and the small uh, organizations where the third party secure security is also uh, sometimes in, in ignored. So, you know, what is, uh, what, what we can do in such cases and what can be their advisory for uh, companies? Uh, because again, I, I agree on what Jatin is asking because a lot of large organizations have their uh, work, which has been already been allocated or outsourced to this small medium enterprises and the security there is also a really good concern. So uh, anyone of you would like to pick up that question. Yeah, so we, we do lots of outsourcing, uh, not necessarily big guys, not necessarily advanced. Uh, so what, what we do is we do vendor audits. Uh, and there are lots of controls that need to be deployed after the audit. We ensure that they are done. What is important is follow up uh, and then ensuring that the controls are up the curve. And that's what we do uh, based yeah. on risk assessment. And we select vendors on based on risk assessment. Whosoever think, handles customer data is compulsorily tracked, audited, monitored, yeah. and uh, there is a security journey. Ajay, I look at it uh, in a different manner. While we may say that because you are large, you know you have uh, more uh, access to capital to make larger investments. Not I also same. believe that uh, when you are small, you are more agile, and you adopt to you know your uh, you know to this evolving situations more quickly than a larger organization. So, you know, coming back to the question, uh, it's not a question of whether we are large, we are small. Today, technology has options, you know, which could be, let's take a range, you know, when you buy a car, you could well buy a car from one lakh to crores, right? It's not that, you know, you have to really have crores to, you know, have a good vehicle. A vehicle is meant to take you from a destination A to destination B. And I believe that's exactly how technology plays into a role. Even there are there are free services. Yes, latency may be an issue, but then uh, when the count is really less, those things may not be that important, or they will not impact a smaller organization as much as a larger organization. The second piece about dependency on third party, it's it's critical, and I think Sundar covered it very well. It's critical that you understand their uh, availability, understand what are the what are they doing. So do not assume that uh, they would be doing the right things. Do not assume that your priority or your organization would be the top priority for them. Uh, it's important that you engage with them. It's important you engage with your third parties. It's also important you understand where you stand in terms of their priority. Are you on the bottom of the hip or are you on the top of the hip? Well, that's an interesting those insight. things will give you a more clarity on where you are really, you know, uh, where you see yourself as an organization, especially if you are a small or medium, you always have a belief that uh, for any third party, I'll be on the bottom of the hill. So uh, talk to them, understand uh, how important you are for your, you know, your vendors. There's no harm in, and there's nothing wrong in doing that. That's the right thing to do. Okay. I'm seeing another question out here that it says, and I'll, I'll try and generalize this. The, the, the question says that President Trump has specifically directed U.S. Department of Health uh, and announced that it will be waiving certain aspects of HIPAA through the Office of uh, Civil Rights without any fear or fight. So let me just generalize this question. Uh, there is also a question on uh, uh, GDPR. So, uh, uh, so this is a question where, uh, you know, uh, what do you think that uh, the compliances, the norms, the frameworks which we were working on and uh, the frameworks which were, uh, or the guidelines or the mandates uh, which were responsible to penalize in the, in the cases of non-compliances. 
do you think that such there has to be some kind of uh, leverage or some kind of a relaxations to be available so that uh, uh, the work from home scenarios and the business continuity can work in the best manner anyone can pick up the question so i'll think, i'll take a stab uh, before uh, anybody else answers uh, kalpesh i think you wanted to go first you can go ahead aditya i'll so, take that i just had one small point to make in this i think uh, looking from a security standpoint because you are working from home doesn't mean that you should be given a lax when private information or personal information is exposed your security mechanism your it infrastructure should already be in a place where you can securely work from home or securely uh, work remotely so i do not believe there should be a you know a slack given to the organizations because they knew these mandates were in place they knew how they are supposed to work in an organization and they should have replicated the same as part of their bcptr to remote locations as well i think uh, ajay my only uh, my only feedback and suggestion is do not get carried away with uh, a lot of political comments uh, end of the day you would be judged for compliance with the law right and the law is black and white so just because a political leader or a party has said some things uh, do not take this as binding because you still end up uh, you know for cases which are filed against you and you would spend humongous efforts trying to defend your position in the law in the court of law you may win eventually but those efforts may not be worth it so for whenever you're taking a deviation make sure you reach out to the right bodies so if it's your pci compliance reach out to your pci board if it's anything to do with gdpr reach out to the respective body you know uh, organizations seek the clarification only once they give a clarification you should assume that you know this is done and dusted otherwise uh, it's all presumptions and those are you no know, You, there is nothing that is going to support you if things go wrong. That's that's an interesting insight. Uh, there are a couple of thoughts which are also coming in. Why don't we explore a stay at office policy for critical functions? And uh, if yes, uh, why? And if no, why it should not be a good idea? No, I think stay at office is a very important thing. And I have said this: not all your functions can uh, really, you know, be moved uh, to work from home. some resources some functions will have to stay at office uh we have to make things interesting what we have done is while we are making uh, employees work from office we also have that some senior leaders are available in the office we have it on terms of roll call so it's a rotation thing uh, just to let them know that uh, we appreciate we have seen your health workers have to be in the office similarly even in it some people will have to be in the office we'll have to enable them let them know they're secure important is hygiene that you're following in your office premises because everybody has a concern uh, are they safe so ensuring that everybody who walks in has a sanitizer uh, we do we have stopped allowing any visitor into the office right uh, we are making sure that even when people are working there is enough of social distancing uh, ensuring that all your workstations and all your your surroundings are hygienically clean you know on a daily basis so those things will give them a comfort um, making sure that the food uh, you know is safe so coming uh, to have... the same question uh, so com- coming with the same question to sundar uh, do you think that stay at office will help uh, work with the critical functions and uh, cater in a better way for the security of the organization compared to work from home scenarios ideally yes but what happens practically is that, uh, you know you have softwares that are difficult like especially the panic scenario that was there yesterday day before uh, where in you to suddenly have then you need to probably give some exceptions and then look at the scenario later these are calls taken then you you do put in countermeasures but not necessarily ideal uh, and therefore i agree with kalpesh and aditya that you need to put in the security controls etc etc uh, to be sure but there are there are trade offs sometimes and uh, especially if the so security application is heavy occupies bandwidth uh, you look at scenarios where somebody is going to access and then you may not have all the best of the controls in place and uh, we look at very small list for that very carefully and then go through uh, necessarily uh, 
a person with long vintage and uh, you know whom you can trust so this this call was taken in fact yesterday and i said mumba i said then my it guy said sundar like you have to forget security of this this aspect uh, uh, for this guy alone for for scots uh, for up to 31st march i said okay let's go ahead because it's an emergency then we revisit at the end of the day it's a business call yeah not this actually not necessarily it depends you know how you look at things uh, you need to enable things also and uh, of course we will put in counter measures there we will put in counter controls i think ajay you will also have to look at it purely from government directives so today i don't think any local governments are going to allow 100% people to be in the office that's a big no you also have to realize now it's beyond technology if you yes. have your people traveling every day your risk of you know spreading uh, the viruses are that increased right so do not look at purely from a technology perspective look at it in terms of the local local law enforcement look at it from you know your exposure and your isolation is definitely the only you know i think that's the only weapon we have at the moment so while we appreciate uh, you know work from home, work from office it should be limited to critical resources only or critical processes only at the moment otherwise a strong i believe very strongly that all of the functions should work from home okay i'll pick up the last uh, uh, last one or two questions before i been mean, we have already at 1 pm we have already into one and a half hour of the webinar so what i'll do is i'll just uh, pick up uh, last question right now and this would be to aditya uh, can we use uh, user behavior analytics automation threat detection tools to prevent cyber attacks during this time do you think is there any impact on user behavior gender specific in terms of being victim knowingly and unknowingly that's a good yeah. question yeah that's a good question so Use i that. think uh, uba uh, definitely would help uh, but the problem from an implementation standpoint happens when you don't have a baseline to compare to so unless you have different set of people actually working for at least one month to three months of time where you can establish those baselines understand the different roles uh maybe based on uh, different uh, genders uh, geolocations uh, business processes what are the different activities that they do and then compare it with the new set that is where you will be uh, more able to understand the anomalies and the deviations from the standard pattern the inbuilt algorithms definitely help but uh, there are a lot of false positives which come through there is a lot of fine tuning that you need to do to ensure that it works at a 100% efficacy so all these things have to be taken in uh, matter um, as the larger picture comes together just implementing a solution would not predominantly make you secure you have to uh, contextualize it to your organization to your business goals and then see how it brings in the value and you know actually projects the return of investment i hope that answered the questions uh, that's a good insight uh, aditya thanks a lot on that uh, uh, are we seeing any more uh, raise of hands uh, um, before we close down uh, uh, we conclude the session uh, so i think far, i just so, saw a question on cloud uh, i think that was more of uh, uh, just a second i think we answered that so we just answered that yes right uh, so thanks a lot uh, i mean uh, sundar kalpesh and aditya it was really great interacting with you and this was one of the first sessions uh, being addressed from a cyber security strength point uh, which was been done by uh, cyber threat community i'm really happy to be a moderator to you guys uh, again it was a lot of learning just to summarize it uh, one of the main takeaways for me in this session was communication is the major key for the activities to stay in bcp uh, to keep on motivating employees security is definitely going to be a great enabler yes uh, the technology enforcement has to be there uh, but this can be only be successful if there is a right level of communications which are happening with the employees and um, making sure that we do address the human factor of it and uh, the lastly uh, uh, keep on communicating what are the right hygiene uh, to to the organizations be it be large be it be small doesn't matter uh, just make sure the communication is on uh, uh, 
there, uh, we do not know right now that uh, is this block or, or the no movement is going to be there for a longer time. But this comes up with a very good uh, you know, learning for all the organizations and businesses which are highly dependent on IT that we still have to be in touch as a human rather than just being so dependent on technology. Uh, Ajay, thanks a lot again. Okay, thanks, thanks. Atan. Uh, only 15 seconds. You rightly said uh, the situation is a first time for a lot of us. So let's collaborate. Uh, and for those of you who attended, in case you need to get in touch with us, you can reach out to us on LinkedIn. We are all part of the group it's, uh, itself, the cyber threat community. So do feel to, you know, free to reach out to us. We'll be more than happy to help wherever we can. And also, don't forget, I mean, we are still active on Twitter. Uh, uh, our panelists and uh, cyber threat moderators will be looking into Twitter in case of any specific queries which can be answered. So feel free, uh, do uh, ask questions, uh, you know, and we'll, we'll try and answer most of them. And if we have not answered any of your questions in this group, uh, please put it on Twitter again. Uh, we'll try and answer it uh, or on, on the Twitter or on the cyber threat groups. Thanks a lot, guys. And uh, Ajay, I'm closing down this. Just yes. one point I wanted to make before we close down. I'm sorry to interrupt. That's uh, right. That's right. I think uh, from a security perspective, we have all talking about the different aspects. But from a human perspective and a responsible citizen, I think everybody should ensure that they are maintaining uh, social distance. And one of the important factors is do not you know, share viral videos or messages or images which might create additional panic. Uh, I believe the government is doing the best they can. The police and the administration is doing the best that they can. Do not panic. Do not hoard uh, groceries at your home because ultimately each other will be impacted by that. So, um, you know, stay responsible, stay secure and wish you all a safe journey ahead. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Aditya. Thanks a lot, Sundar, for your time. Thanks, and thanks. Kalpesh. Uh, wonderful. Thanks Linda. a lot, guys. It's, it was wonderful interacting with, I think, a very lively audience. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Thanks a lot, guys. Stay safe. Uh, God bless all. Bye. Thanks. Bye, guys.